Hello everyone! Welcome to Coverage Inc.'s Pro Webinar Series. Today we'll be talking about do you have what it takes? And with me are as always Jim. Good morning, Jim. Hello, Planet Earth. <laughs> Excellent. As well as Linda Voorhees and Tim Alba. Uh, Tim is running a little bit late. He'll be joining us as soon as possible. Good morning, Linda. Good morning to you and good morning to my riders. It's really nice to be here with you. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I think most people uh, have an understanding that I'm very affiliated with UCLA. Uh, and have a real interest and devotion to writers and writing. And uh, I'm, I'm absolutely obsessed with screenwriting. I'm absolutely obsessed with my writers. And that is uh, the direction of my life and the direction of my focus. And, um, you know, I am I allowed, I, I'm allowed to use bad language on this, right? Absolutely. Uh, well, I bullshit about a lot in life, but the one thing I never, never, never bullshit about is writing because my writers have to know me, trust me, and so any information I give is just a real straight shot. Beautiful. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> so today, as you know, uh, we're going to talk about do you have what it takes to essentially survive in this business. So here's a little bit of an overview, the right I stuff. The wrong stuff. Go ahead, Jim. Tanya, but before we move forward into this thing, uh, Linda, um, can you please tell us a little bit about ProPath screenwriting? I know I know this is a new venture that you and Tim have, or relatively new, have started, and that you both hail from uh, UCLA. But what is ProPath's special sauce? What's it all about? Well, ProPath is very uh, much about the hands-on writing process. And we're going to talk uh, uh, from, from what I'm seeing on the overview a lot about uh, writing and what it takes. And um, there's a lot of uh, mythology about writing and the success of writing. And I have a bias that there's too much emphasis on talent. There's sort of a mysticism there is an element of who gets granted the gift and who doesn't. Uh, but the truth of the matter is talent is the one thing, as someone who's taught at UCLA for 25 years, I never worry about talent because talent is a given and it's finite. And whatever that talent is, it will not go up, it will not go down. But what can work, must work, um, it, and uh, and becomes a demand for a writer who's going to be successful is to learn the craft, the tools, and how to use them effectively. And that's what ProPath is about, is sticking with the basics and then going beyond the basics. And um, so we really are focusing, you know, when we did the, um, when we were doing sort of a canvas of what's out there in terms of, um, a available seminars, weekend uh, uh, opportunities uh, for writers who are on the learning curve. A lot of them now are kind of the feel-good therapy um, kind of life coach for the writers. And there is a place for that. I don't denigrate it because writers are fragile in some ways. Oh, and yeah. they do a lot of hand-holding. But um, we realized that somehow the mechanics, the, the structure, the tools have sort of fallen into a trench in a way that you need to have something you can sell, something you can market, something you can stand behind. And because of the shift of the industry um, going toward TV, how to also take that screenplay, write it as a screenplay, and then also use it as a pilot. So we really are looking at how to get writers on track with their own writing and to to keep that toolbox, um, you know, fully stocked, fully supplied. And more than that, that the writer knows how to use the tools. And awesome. you can find ProPath where? Well, ProPath right now is in uh, L.A., um, and uh, we are going to have an August rewrite uh, weekend, and uh, you can go to ProPath Screenwriting, and it'll give you the information. 
Um, but basically, uh, Tim and I just sat down and said, we're at a point now where most of the contest, uh, the deadline, you know, for the for the what I would call the super contest, they've come and gone. So that gives you time to to take a script, rewrite it, get it ready for the industry, and quite frankly, get ready for the next deadline. So we're going to focus on rewriting. We are hoping to do some workshops uh, very shortly. Uh, we don't have those scheduled yet, but it's going to be LA based to begin with. And awesome. Cool. And I think Tim just joined us. Hello, yeah, Tim. That's the classic uh, LA jerk move by showing up to the meeting five minutes late. So I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> that's How not, are you? <laughs> that, actually, that is what to do in Hollywood, right? You're supposed to show up uh, fashionably late. So my apologies. Put the attention on you. Yeah, my, my apologies. That was definitely not my intention. And good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm, morning, coming, good morning. I'm actually coming to you from Roanoke, Virginia. I'm here for six weeks uh, doing some work. And so uh, so it's one in the afternoon for me. So I'm a little ahead of you guys in terms of coffee consumption. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right. So let's jump right in and let's look at three types of successful writers. And of course, we're starting with the connected it's good to be connected <laughs> so jim what do we mean by connected well first let's preface this with saying there are probably more than three types but i think these three archetypes probably are compromise yeah, com comprise about 90 percent of writers and um also being in one category does not uh you know preclude being in another you could be all three you could be one you could be two but but the first the connected is uh, you know it's the shortest distance between two points if you are lucky enough to be born with that silver spoon and just happen to uh you know know people in the industry you know your dad or your mother is an industry icon things are just a lot easier you you, you know you don't generally have to do the work i mean it doesn't again it doesn't preclude you from being talented or brilliant or, or a genius but it's just a lot easier to get somewhere if you're not if you know all these people and the expectations are that the industry will just open the door for you so um if you're not lucky enough to be one of the connected um sit down and think about it maybe you do know somebody who do you know who do your family and friends know who did you go to school with connect the dots however you can you may be surprised let's say for example you went to you went to uni uh, school at uh like i did suny purchase new york well who the hell went to school at suny purchase new york who's in the industry well surprisingly there are a few people and if you find those people and you network with them at uh you know alumni events or dinners or anything like that or you find that there's an actor or somebody who went to suny purchase that's your entree you can call them up and say hey fellow brethren from suny purchase would you read my screenplay so it, it it's always a possibility never neglect to seek out those connections you may find you have them even if you don't think you do oh and <laughs> Beware the C list. I just want to throw that in there too, because some connections are worth way more than others. And you know, uh, you may like, for example, your sister-in-law's, uh, you know, uh, gardener might be the gardener for Roseanne Barr, but you do not necessarily want her attached to your new romantic comedy. <laughs> <laughs> Good advice. And let me just add, what helps is you know, go through your social media, through your Facebook, through your Instagram, and see if you're already connected with someone. And later on, we'll talk a little bit more about networking. But yes, it is important because most of us aren't born with those connections and we have to find ways to make them true true tim did you have a comment yeah i think what i would add to that and i'm not sure if this is something we're going to chat about later but i know um i mean like when you're in a class whether it's at ucla or wherever it may be you know what i always tell my students and i think linda would say the same thing is you know we're not the most important person in the room it's right. everybody around the table who are the most important people in the room and somebody at that table is gonna break through and so that's another person you may know right um uh and you want to take advantage obviously of those relationships as well but 
there's a really tr- you know fine line between harassment and and uh, you know polite reaching out and uh, you know you have to be really careful about how you cage what you're asking for and what your ask is. I always say lead with asking what you can do for the person who um, you're asking for something from. Uh, I think you know the majority of us are constantly asked what we can do for other people, but nobody ever asks us what they can do for us, and so that very, stands out to me. Yeah, yeah. very very true. The, uh, the other thing with the connections is as soon as you have a script that's ready to go, obviously get it registered, um, but then start telling people, even if you don't think they're in the radius of the business, and just start saying, I have a script. I don't know where to take it. It's ready to go. You don't have to pitch the script to people who aren't in the industry. Um, but you can pitch the fact that you have a, a project that needs to get to someone. And I've always been amazed at that little circuitry that will find a path. So uh, even if you're in the middle of Iowa, start telling your Aunt Bertha, you know, I got a script. And then, Aunt, you know, so start telling people that you've got something that's marketable. Obviously, register it first. Don't be, I, don't, be, don't be precious is what I'm saying. I, I have a great and very short anecdote to just accentuate exactly what you just uh, what you just said. Um, when I was living in New York 30 years ago before I moved out here and I had written one of my first screenplays and uh, I used my mother, who was an NYPD cop uh, detective yeah. at the time as my technical advisor. So she knew about the script. And uh, afterwards, I said, uh, Ma, I have no idea what to do. I, I don't know anybody. You know, I'm living here in New York. And uh, she said, let me ask around. And then she comes back the next day. She had asked around her, her colleagues at the police department. And she said, oh, yeah, uh, a buddy of mine knows the head of Paramount. Uh, here's his number. So yeah. I called. And next thing I know, I'm, I'm literally on the phone with Henry Segerman, who was the head of Paramount at the time. And he's like, pitch me your script. Uh, I, I did. It didn't go anywhere. He passed. But I, the fact is, by simply asking, I got him on the phone. And and the second part of that is ask for what you want. So when I say to Aunt Bertha, yeah, I got a script. I'm in the middle of Bumfuck, Iowa. And she says, wait a minute, wait a minute. I have a friend in my church prayer group that <laughs> knows a, a, a you know, a commercial producer in Des Moines who used to work for, and then she says, don't say bumfuck because she's in a prayer group. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm always amazed. At, say it out loud and ask for what you want and keep saying it. Don't be precious. Yeah. Very good advice. The next type of successful writer is the schmoozer. <laughs> now we talked a little bit about networking already, so that ties in very nicely with networking in other words you know how to meet people how to talk to people how to in essence sell yourself and before we get into that in more detail let me just say from what i've noticed and it's very interesting um, the people who are usually the best at schmoozing are usually the worst at writing and uh, vice versa and i think that's because if you want to get to a certain level if you don't have it in one area, you have to make up for it in the other area. Yeah. Well, so let me let me just uh, throw my comment in here on, on the, the whole schmoozer thing. You know, um, yeah, it, it, talent is not necessarily required to be a schmoozer. It's just a personality type. You know, if you're that really salesy, gregarious type of person, and you just you're just a natural at working in the room, and you've decided you want to be a screenwriter, you can do it. It's, you know, you may not be able to write at all. And frankly, that may not matter. Uh, I personally know someone who was very successful in Hollywood and had an amazing career because he was a world class schmoozer, could not write his way out of a paper bag. But what he was was a raconteur. He could tell a story and captivate a room. When it came down to putting it on paper, it was epic fail. But but he was entertaining to execs. He was fearless. He'd approach anyone and everyone. And by the time his career ended, he had amassed an incredible collection of, of Hollywood contacts, friends. I mean, his parties were epic. Um, 
but he was just a terrible writer. And you know what? It didn't matter because people would love to invite him in for a meeting. They knew that it was uh, an hour where they could just sort of sit back and be entertained. And he was everybody's buddy. It was just a wonderful quality to have. Um, so if you've got that skill, awesome. And if you don't, we'll talk about what to do uh, if you're not that type of person. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Tim, did you have a comment about it? No, I think you have, I mean, uh, yeah, I think that gets you to a certain point, but obviously I think, um, and yeah, I, I mean, I think the, the super highway of Hollywood is littered with people who are, you know, really good at selling things to people that they don't necessarily need, um, <laughs> or they don't know why they're buying it. Uh, I mean, that's all part of the game, right? But, but I also feel like, you know, that only gets you so far and ultimately, and a, a lot depends on, you know, exactly what your goals are. Um, I think as a producer, that's a very important skill to have. As a writer, they're still going to have to read your script. And, and you know, after a while, you know, being a great schmoozer, but following up with really crappy material only gets you so far, I think. And I do think in this way, Hollywood can be a small town mm -hmm. uh, that once you get the reputation for, uh, all bark and no bite that you just don't you just don't have the substance uh, the producers do tend to move on and we all know those people who sort of float along and it sounds like your friend really had a career as a schmoozer but, but uh, I would say that's probably the exception to the rule now uh, just because information is so available and uh, then that comes with reputation yeah. writers are are known for being misanthropic so it doesn't it doesn't completely <laughs> terrify uh, a producer to have a writer who's sullen or uh, a, a little bit uncommunicative in the meeting. It's the producer's job to get the best out of that writer, including the moment you meet them. Having said that, though, um, you know, we're all fairly formed as adults. So if you don't have the the what I call the cocktail chatter gene, you probably aren't going to acquire it after the age of 22. You just aren't. You're pretty <laughs> cool. uh, so If you have it, great. You'll do great in pitch meetings and all that. But in this day and age, they want more. They want more. They want more. And the other thing is writers have a very bad reputation for pitching and not delivering. So everyone's antenna is up on that. I'll, I'll be honest with you. And everyone wants a sample and they typically want a treatment. They, you know, they're, they're asking for more than personality at this point. Um, so anyway, yeah, that's but I, yeah, no, I agree with all that. And I agree with Jim and I agree with Linda. And I think, you know, um, I think what's important is to, <laughs> this is going to sound weird, but is to be memorable. Um, right. You know, yes. whether it's with the way you purport yourself, you know, when you meet somebody or because, I mean, think about it. Like we're looking at this picture, you right. know, the schmoozer. I mean, and right. people get schmoozed all the time. Right. Yeah. And you know, after a while, I think you become immune to it and you can't remember who you talk to. And so do anything you can to be memorable, but not, you know, psychotic, obviously. <laughs> yeah. Don't be obnoxious. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, you, you said it much more clearly than I did. <laughs> all right. So the talented, they do exist. The talented writers. Yes. So well, I think, I think all of us, all of us here are, are basically here to cultivate this particular type, this one of the three. The, mm -hmm. the other two, you have limited control over, uh, but this one you do have control over. Um, some of us are innately talented. Others have to develop it and learn it. And, um, you know, that uh, Tim and Linda, obviously, that's what you guys do is cultivate that. And, and basically, it's what we do here at Coverage Inc. as well. Sure. But um, you know, the town. Okay, so let's just run down the list here. Talent, the talented success via strength of the word smithery alone. You don't have contacts. You are not a good schmoozer, but if it's on the page, boom, you're golden. Uh, this person understands how to tell a compelling story. Usually, but not always, has done the work required to become successful. Um, you know, some people are just naturally brilliant when it comes to screen story and structure. Others have to learn it um, and take the time. It usually takes a lot of time. Uh, usually, but not always, 
has good work habits, you know, dedicates a certain amount of time every day to screenwriting, to self-improvement and, you know, sets goals and, and follows through. Um, this person has lots of ideas. They, they, you know, they have lots of plates spinning. They are working on multiple different projects. They are smart about the business. They're not writing uh, for years on a project that is completely uncommercial. And, and everyone knows upon hearing it in 10 seconds, it will never see the light of day because they are smart. They cultivate what they're working on and, they, and, and, and they're, they're just smart about it. Uh, and lastly, that talent inspires others to help them. In other words, when you're there, when you're at that point where people can see your talent from 10,000 feet, people will often volunteer to help you. you. You don't necessarily have to go approach your friends and ask them, hey, can you read my screenplay or do something for me? Or, you know, that guy you said you knew, would you call him for me? Because if they know you're talented, they'll come and they'll ask you. And when you get to that point, it's a beautiful thing. I'm still waiting to get to that point, but that's what people tell me. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, Tim, Linda, do you have anything to add to the talent portion? Well, I think we're kind of spoiled in our affiliation with UCLA because obviously we get a lot of talented people come through our doors and they're vetted and you know we go through the uh, application and interview process and um so we're lucky in terms of you know we're already picking from you know a pretty high um you know level of person but yeah i know for me whenever you know i get a call from an agent or a manager producer looking for new material new people or i reach out to somebody to kind of share somebody with someone you know the first question is always you know are they are they really good or are they just the pers the best writer in your class? And those are two very different types of people. Um, and you want to be able to tell whoever you're referring someone to that they're that they're prolific, that they're idea generators. Um, you know that they, like you said, are spinning six different plates at the same time, have a lot of stuff going on, but are focused and results driven. I think that's super important. Uh, and I, I, I agree with that. The other thing that I do find is sometimes talented people depend too much on talent alone. It still has to be material, story, character delivered for the medium in which it's to be displayed. And ultimately, if it's a popular medium, which film, TV, uh, if that's a popular medium, that means you have to entertain an audience. And so your talent has to be focused in a way that is about the business. And I do find sometimes writers are a bit precious with talent. And I am gonna just go on a little bit of a spiel here. I often have talented writers that I quite frankly uh, tell them to find someone who can give them really worthwhile coverage. And I'm not being self-serving in saying that because I know that you guys do coverage, but it is often a wake up call that it isn't enough just to have that inherent built in talent. You have to deliver it in a way that the industry can say, I can make a movie, I can make a dollar. Not only can I get an audience in this weekend, but they will pay to see it again next weekend. And coverage uh, is often the wake up call that sometimes a work workshop can't give you um, because it's, it's uh, someone who typically doesn't know you, knows the industry, knows the requirements of the industry and is reading your stuff cold. And so when you can find coverage and then secondarily take it like a professional, when you get that coverage, say, what is here that can direct my, what is I know a good story, but direct it toward the industry in a way that will make it marketable. Yep. So that's my spiel. <laughs> I could not agree more. And this brings us to the four types of unsuccessful writers. And I think uh, your story ties right in with number one, the defensive and um, running a coverage company. We come across those people, you know, once in a while. <clears throat> so, you know, it's of course it is difficult and we know it's difficult if you think you've written something 
absolutely awesome. And then you send it out for coverage and you get seven pages of notes back. And yeah, it can sting. That's normal. And you kind of want to go, oh no, oh my God. And kind of throw the coverage in the corner for a day or two. If that's what you have to do, do that. But then, you know, bring it back out and look at it and try to understand what you can do um, to make your script better. And also know that the reason for the coverage is to improve the script. And right. it's not just it's not just coverage. It's, it's yes, that's exactly true. But it's not just coverage. It's it's you know defensive about an, anything you know contests right. or yeah. you know yeah. re rejection in general um, from from anything you're trying to do within the field. A lot of people, frankly, are just not interested in that. They they really just want to do their own thing, follow their own muse. Right. Um, it says here on the list, you know, often uses writing as therapy. And you know, we do we do have and have had some clients in the past that. They're, they have no interest in really being a screenwriter. I mean, they say they do, but really what they're doing is, you know, writing is cheaper than using a therapist. So mm -hmm. so they just sit down and, and, you know, they tell their life story or they vent or they, they write these Mary Sue versions of themselves that are wish fulfillment or, or whatever it is. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just, you know understand that that's what it is and if if you're trying to elevate and actually be successful in the industry you're going to have to push harder than that right absolutely it, you know uh, part of the, part of what i say to writers and i know tim gets at this too is when we are in workshop it isn't just about that script that's in front of you and uh you know i talked a little bit about the rewrite uh workshop we have coming up in august but one of, the re one of the things that we have an interest in is teaching the writer to think like a writer. And we've all had that student who wants a cheerleader and not a critic, uh, wants a validator and not someone who is going deeper with the work. I'm less interested in that, I'm there for that. But we want to look at people who are really in it because this is a, a profession that demands the next part of the screenplay, which is to get produced, made, and then someone pays money to see it. If you have anything else, that's called a student script, that's called a student film, and your mother may like it, but she's not paying to see it. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, maybe maybe she is. <laughs> You might be financing it, but yeah. <laughs> Very good. Let me uh, quickly interject with, uh, we already have some awesome questions coming in, so that's great. And we will get to all of them uh, during the Q&A section. Um, and let me, uh, yeah. So uh, I just want to uh, jump in on the defensive a little bit because, again, we see it a lot in um, uh, doing coverage and running yeah. a company and again just think this is not I mean there are people not I mean I you know not here but somewhere out there there are people who use their you know like analysts who use their own frustrations when they uh, cover a script and that's not cool to take it out on writers right. uh, so that does happen however yeah. uh, most of the time like here at coverage Inc we uh, quality control everything that comes uh, that goes in and out so to make sure that you guys get the best quality of things that actionable notes and things to do and that nobody right. is you know being abused sure sure right well, well and so, I think so, but you don't get to that place of getting an actionable note if you're defensive right I exactly mean, yeah exactly so, I mean uh, the story I always tell is you know you run in like we go to the Austin Film Festival every year I moderate panels I meet tons of you know writers there I recommend the festival it's an amazing festival and people will come up to you after you moderate a panel they'll be like oh my gosh I'm working on a script really similar to you know the one you mentioned in the panel or whatever you know can I tell you a little bit about it and of course you're you know you want to be polite so you're like sure and then they give you the quick you know 45 second pitch and then you say you know well that's interesting but you know 
but maybe you could think of this or this or this. And they're like, but, you know, they get super defensive right away. And so for me, that's a huge red flag. I'm like, why would I even want to read this person's work? If they're already defensive when I'm giving them a note based on their quick pitch, just think how defensive they're going to be when they get a full stack of notes on a whole script. Right. The business is collaborative, you know, I mean, right. it's, you want, even if you don't necessarily agree with that note, if Tim is telling that to you, you should probably say, you know what, let me think on that, you know, that'll, that'll right. create a much more positive impression and you don't have to take the note, but, but the point is you're, you're showing that you are ready to listen and ready to collaborate. That's, uh, that is so key. Yeah, absolutely. The, the, the word, but is a discussion. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And also, let me just throw this in as well, because I, I think too many people are not aware of this because too many people seem to think that, OK, I'll do my first draft and then I'll fix some commas and then I'm done. Yeah. Usually, right. no. 20 drafts, 30 drafts are normal. And I am so thankful to Jordan Peele, who was very honest and open about uh, it took him 37 drafts to get yeah. get out uh, in, in into the final shape. And that, again, that is normal, guys. That is normal. Mm -hmm. That is normal. And that's why you don't want to stall on the first draft. Uh, and um, that that's really important. And, and we, we're going to talk about essentially the first four drafts of rewrite. But for, for those four drafts of rewrite, you're doing four drafts for each of those. So that's 16 right there. That's 16 right there. Um, but um, the other thing I want to say about uh, being defensive is when you are in a meeting because someone wants your script, wants to develop it, wants to produce it, uh, you have to be in the meeting as a writer. They want to have confidence in you. And the most um, powerful person in the room is the person who's the most persuasive. So if you, the writer, you must know what to hang on to, what to let go of, what, what note to take, and what note to negotiate. That means you have to have a skill set as a professional writer to be persuasive in a way that is about the story. Absolutely. And again, that is a difference between uh, I'm here for the story and, oh, you hurt my feelings. That's, right. that's right. two very different things. Right, right. right. And then so the next category up of the unsuccessful writers is the underwriter um, or <laughs> the, the person who doesn't write. So, you know, some of the characteristics rewrites the same script over and over for 10 years. Uh, maybe they find representation, but then they lose representation because they keep asking their agent or manager to keep sending out the same damn script and never give them anything new. Uh, they're in it for the label because they want to identify as writer, uh, not to actually be creative, not to not to write. And at the end of the day, they have no real ideas, or maybe they had one idea, but you know, they're they're not generating new ideas all the time, which is what the industry is looking for in in a writer. To be a professional writer, you need to be an idea machine. Right. Yep. Right. Right, Absolutely. right. Couldn't have said right. more clearly ourselves, obviously. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly. And, exactly. And, and we see that at UCLA all the time as someone takes one script and takes it through every quarter. And we call it beijing it out. It starts as this bright, sparkling script that may have a few problems here and there, but you really see how wonderful it is. The characters are interesting. The dialogue is dazzling. You have a few warts with structure, but that's stuff you can fix. Then every quarter they dull it down. They dull it down. And, and to the point that it is so beige that what was wonderful, uh, you, you don't even recognize anymore. So that's the other part of overworking a script instead of going on to something new. It's just horrible. Absolutely. And also what I always find fascinating, not in a good way, are those people who oh, are so tortured by the process of writing. They simply yeah. cannot sit down and write because they're so tortured. So then my yeah. question is, then why are you a writer? I mean, seriously. Yeah. And the truth of the matter is uh, when writers get together, 
we almost uh, we don't usually talk about our own process like we don't cuz that cry last, last thing i want to yeah. talk about <laughs> yeah. yeah and and we might talk about the story we're working on in just a mechanical sense but we typically you know talk about the business talk about the money talk about it really is it's about other stuff you know our our headgears in other ways so you can almost always tell a new writer because they're they're a little bit melodramatic about the writing itself. <laughs> I go, can you put that on the page, my darling? Put that on the page. <laughs> <You know. laughs> exactly. Um, number three, the clueless. Um, well, we, we don't need to. Buy a clue. <laughs> we, yeah, we don't need to spend much time talking about the clueless. I think we all know who these people are. We've seen them. The, you know, their ideas are bad. Uh, they do not take the time or trouble to educate themselves. They don't care about that. Um, they're constantly sending out material into the business that isn't ready. You know, clogging up the arteries with you know with their plaque of awfulness. And um, you know, they will they will never. You get anywhere they're not really interested in doing the work that's required to ever really become successful uh you can't talk to the i mean you can talk to these people but you know they'll never get it exactly and then this uh, on this point let me jump in with my personal pet peeve uh the idea that gee i can wake up one morning and decide i'm a writer now because i decided i'm a writer now Really? So would you wake up one morning and say, I'm a doctor now, then go to the ER and say, hey, uh, can I go and like cut someone open, please? <laughs> you know, basically, you know, learn your craft, learn your craft. Well, I think, well, that, I yeah, think um, there's, a gentleman by the, there's a gentleman by the name of Dennis Palumbo, P-A-L-U-M-B-O. He wrote... Oh, yeah my favorite year with Peter O'Toole and yep. became kind of a big deal as a writer when that film came out and was at the top of his game for a couple of years. And then he got sick of the grind and the deal and just wasn't enjoying it. So he quit and he became a therapist for screenwriters and he's very good at what he does. And he, I'm not sure if he still does, but he used to write a column for written by a magazine. For written and, by, yeah. Yeah. And, and he's got a great book that I recommend to everybody I encounter who's looking. Yeah. It's called Writing from the Inside Out. And, you know, he, a, an article that he wrote by, for written by was all about how everybody thinks they're a writer. Um, mm -hmm. And I have the utmost respect for people who decide they want to write because it's not an easy thing to do, that's for sure. But I think, you know, one thing that a lot of new writers don't realize is that, you know, you have to continue to create, continue to expand, continue to educate yourself and get better and better, all the while you're appeasing your agent or your manager, uh, keeping your producer happy, dealing with actors, dealing with your spouses, dealing with your significant others. Um, you know, it's a, you're going to get hammered from all sides. And so it's really important for you to be clued in, not to be clueless. Um, how's that for tying into your thing? Mm -hmm. um, but seriously, I think um, you know it's easy for, and just like you, you know, just like you had said, Tanya, the the whole, you know, you don't just wake up one morning and say, I want to be a brain surgeon, right? I mean, that takes 20 years of training and education and internships and whatever they call those other things that doctors do for the real doctors. Um, you know, we have to look at our own careers the same way, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well said, well said. Yeah, and uh, so, the, so the vast majority, however, of, of you know, writers that we see coming into to Coverage Inc. And, you know, we, we've done a lot of contests. We've, you know, done a lot, a lot of outreach with writers. The vast majority are, are none of those three previous categories. The vast majority are the fourth category, which is the mediocre. Um, and you know, so the mediocre, I mean, look, Hey, I'm in the, I'm in that category most of the time as a writer myself, you know, <laughs> decent ideas, may, sure. You know, not bad ideas. The writing's not terrible generally. Again, these are all generalizations, but you know, they're, but you know, there's something wrong. Uh, you know, maybe the dialogue is, you know, just on the nose. Um, there, maybe there's no subtext, maybe the structure's off or maybe the characterization, 
is flimsy. You know, usually a good indication that your characterization is flimsy is when you start on page one with the inciting incident and you haven't spent the 10 pages getting to know the character in their known world, as we say in, right. in mytho mythologically speaking. Um, right. So that means you have flimsy one dimensional characters generally. Um, you know, and, you know, oftentimes the script could maybe become something if maybe someone else rewrote it. Um, now, the great thing about being in this category is you do have the ability to elevate. Um, you know, maybe if Vanna actually gave you the clue, uh, you could <laughs> you, you could actually do that. So that, you know, while probably 70 percent of Courage and clients fall into this category, our job is to get them out of that category. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. And I, and I think sometimes people want to jump into that pool a little too quickly. Um, you know, I think you guys offer a great service and it's an important service and it's important, you know, for, for new writers to know where they kind of fall amongst their peers and what better way to figure that out than, you know, to get coverage from someone who knows nothing about your script. Um, but a lot of times people, you know, I, I see this a lot. Uh, in the professional program at UCLA, it's a year-long certificate program, um, great program, and you see people come to that to Los Angeles to do that program from all over the country. They sell their houses, they uproot their families, they come, and and they're of the perception that, oh, I'm just going to write these two scripts during the year at UCLA, and then I'll go out and, you know, sell my scripts and become a millionaire, and, you know, really it's the first year of a five-year grind before you even get to that place, and it's an incremental preparation right and I think people after a first draft of the second script they've ever written they're probably not ready for that blind read just yet you know I think you have to you have to extinguish your close friends and the people that you've met by networking um, before you actually go to that kind of stranger thing because it's a different ball game yeah 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 well also uh, you have to be at a point where you understand the notes and despite the right. fact that we're very very simple clear and straightforward i find that sometimes uh we get in scripts and we give back the notes and they don't understand the notes right, Great point. right. and i see that too um is that you know because tim and i give notes all the time we do consultant work you know uh we, we've done a lot of work beyond our own and you give a note and you have a blank stare and you realize that they just don't have the step-by-step -step methodology now because tim and i quite frankly are very good at what we do we know how to back up and meet you where you are as a writer that's what we do but when you are getting coverage and someone sends you those notes that becomes your responsibility to as a as a writer who is pursuing the profession in a professional way to have the skill set in place to execute those notes. And I think that's where the defensiveness comes in and, and where all the yeah buts come in. It's, it, it is a mechanism of not being able to say, I don't know, I don't know how to rewrite, I don't know how, I don't. And there's nothing wrong with that because there's a whole skill set that goes with that, but you, you've got to have the skill set. You've got to go in as a professional. Exactly. Let's talk about requirements for the game. And on number one, we have Cashola. Uh, and the reason for that is often uh, people underestimate what life costs or what life in L.A. costs or what being a screenwriter costs. And we just recently talked someone out of, you know, uprooting his job and moving to L.A. right now, right at this moment. Um, because... Good. Good. The rent in LA is, is just awful, awful, awful. Uh, and then you have a lot of you have classes and contests that you need to pay for. Yeah, you don't have to be in LA anymore. You don't have to be. You have to be aware uh, and knowledgeable, but you don't have to have an apartment in Santa Monica. Yeah, and I mean, also, from and, personal, I mean, just real quickly, mm -hmm. personal experience. I mean, one of my, you know, ex uh, past students at Nushin Jahanian, who, um, right. you know, I, I took her script and sold her script to E1 uh, that she had written in one of my classes. I mean, she was a, a lobbyist in DC. She owned her own lobbying firm, and and um, you know, she's just 
gotten hired to do her first assignment. So she's sold a spec and now she's doing a pretty high level assignment all in the first three months of her career. You know, granted she spent six years trying to break in, but she lives in DC. She's not leaving DC. She has little kids, yeah. uh, you know, the pitch, her pitch meeting that she did for her latest assignment, she did it all over Skype. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, that can happen. Um, you know, it's not the norm, but it can happen. And so, yeah, and you definitely. Can, if you can live someplace else where your life is simpler and not as expensive, right, so you can focus right. more on your work, I, I'm all for that. Yeah, you can read all, all about uh, that on the ProPath Screenwriting blog, blog page because uh, there's a great story about all that. Um, success, yeah. Yep. Yeah, and um, also let me, let me just quickly jump in that even if you, uh, if you want to move to LA, excellent plan for it in other words if you are somewhere else in the country a study your craft make sure you have uh, at least a couple of completely bulletproof scripts ready to go make sure you have some money saved up make <laughs> sure in other words make sure you have a game plan make sure if you move to la you can hit the ground running Right. Well, look, I, I came here 30 years ago. I, I got a $600 a month apartment in Van Nuys that had a parking space and a swimming pool and a gym. Oh, and it was furnished. OK, you can't do that anymore. Yeah. I mean, I, I had no clue. I had no connections. I had no nothing. And you know what? It was totally fine because, you know, you could do that back then. Right. You can't. Right. You can't you can't do that anymore. Uh, right. Let's just let's just move through these real really quickly because we're running short on time. Uh, time. Uh, you got to make sure that you set aside time to write every day. Otherwise, what is the point? Again, these are the requirements for being taken seriously by this profession. You have to be generating material all the time. Set aside the time, get organized, prioritize your writing. Uh, commitment, okay? If you can do anything else, do it. I mean, I'm sure all of you guys have probably heard this before, but this should be the, your very last choice. You know, if you are... <laughs> If you are a great car mechanic, hey, great, write a blog on the side, you know, uh, become a YouTuber, you know, there are plenty of ways that, that you can okay. write and Absolutely. get that out let there. Me, let, me, uh, let me rephrase that a bit, though. If you can be happy doing yeah. anything else, That's do it. Yeah, okay, I'll go with that. <laughs> <laughs> because let's face it, we all can hopefully do other things. I mean, we can, you know, tie our shoelaces. Uh, we can do other things than write. But, you know, if you can be happy doing anything else, do that. Yeah, I meant if you love fixing fixing cars. <laughs> yeah. you know, exactly. uh, write tools for the job. Um, you know, uh, this is just so basic, basic, basic. But, you know, you, you, you really do need to have good proper screenwriting software. Don't be writing in Microsoft Word. If you're using one of those free you know, screenwriting overlays, you know, it never looks right. There, there's always something wrong about it. People judge you on everything. You need to understand how busy the assistants are in this town, the people who generally are the ones who read your screenplays, the, even the interns with their stack of scripts to read every night. And if your script doesn't look right, they're just right. going to pass. They, right. they, you know, and, and you know, they'll read a couple pages. They'll, you know, if they have to write any coverage on it, they'll do a, they'll base it on the first three pages of the script that they read. Do not right. give them an excuse to pass. Just spend the money and get a copy of Fade In. It's seventy nine bucks. A used copy of Final Draft on eBay, right. fifty bucks right. for crying out loud. Right. Um, and, and by the way, I'm just rolling through these guys, but feel free to jump in. Uh, an ear for dialogue. You know, right. th this is something, it, it, Tim, in the, in the last webinar you participated in back, back in March, which was a wonderful webinar. If you guys haven't heard it, please go to coverageinc.com to the webinar page and check it out. It was a brilliant, uh, Tim was just great. He was on fire. We were just talking about uh, how to write great dialogue. Um, and, an well, ear for dialogue, being, being able to... Keep what's in that? mind. Keep in mind that the typical script is 80% dialogue. 80% the typical script. It's important. <laughs> it's it's important. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and Tim, you were talking about, um, you know, who was it? Uh, the, the fellow who wrote uh, Dallas Buyers Club, right? About how he, he got, how we got the voice for that character. What was that anecdote again? We spent a lot of time with them. Uh, he actually went and spent like three or four days with them. Um, 
but he it was an amalgamation of a lot of different people um and he would go to more specifically to get the voice not necessarily for the matthew mcconaughey character but rather for the supporting character um he would hang out at a the donut hut at some donut hut like in west hollywood from 2 a.m to 5 a.m where you know a lot of people are coming out of clubs and um you know, hanging out and stuff and would buy people coffee and smoke cigarettes with them and just talk to them. And that's how you got a sense of how, you know, people within that world would speak and, you know, act and purport themselves. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Listen, listen to the people around you. Listen to what they're saying, especially teenagers. That's something writers tend to write badly. <laughs> right. Uh, listen children, to the way contemporary children, teens speak. Yeah. Children in general, teenagers in general are, it tends to be very bad dialogue. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, comprehensive knowledge of your genre. Again, basic, basic, basic. Whatever it is that is your special sauce, you need to be the expert at that. You know, If you're not the one amongst your friend group who everybody knows, oh yeah, if you want to know something about sci-fi, you know, call Brian. Uh, oh yeah, he's the guy. You know, you need to be that person and whatever it is, because then, you know, that comprehensive knowledge will not only, you know, make you an expert or a go-to person, but it will give you the tools that you need to solve story problems in your own work, because you'll be able to say, oh yeah, back in Forbidden Planet, they did this. Right. Um, right. Um, personality type. You know, um, we could probably have a whole webinar just on this, um, but but this is just really it's about you know being the person that people want to work with you guys please weigh in on this i'm sure you've got plenty of plenty of stories and comments on this one <laughs> well, well i also think tim said it best when he said uh be memorable now you want to be memorable as a writer and not as a psychotic but uh but to be memorable in the room is important and writers are known to be typically the coolest person in the room. We typically are. And that needs to be you. <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, um, you know, be professional. Be be somebody people want to spend time with. I mean, for example, like I said, you know, the Nushin example that, you know, she was a student of mine. So I knew her because I'd spent, you know, hours with her, you know, developing a material class. But then when I, you know, took it upon myself to introduce her to my producing partner, I mean, she was very professional. She stood up to him. He can be a little overbearing and she stood up to him and, and he was impressed. I mean, he was like, mm -hmm. look, she doesn't suffer fools. And I think it's important to know what you want and to know how to get it. Um, and be somebody that people want to spend time with. And that doesn't mean you have to be smarmy and disgusting and gross, but, you know, just, I mean, because it's a marriage. You're going to have to spend, you right. know, I've probably spent 100 hours on Skype with Nushin over the last two months, you know, in story meetings, and she's a delightful person. I would, she's somebody I would go to dinner with. She's somebody I would hang out with, and I think that's something that a lot of people overlook. That is right. so key. That is so key. You you are starting a relationship with someone in the business, hopefully, you know, a producer, for example, who's going to roll the dice on you. You need to be someone they want to hang out with. Uh, if, they're, if they're like, oh, God, this guy, when when their phone rings, uh, that relationship isn't going to go anywhere, no matter how brilliant the writing on the page is. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Absolutely. Moving on to business savvy, be a student of the biz and understand how it works. And actually, uh, one would think that kind of we wouldn't even have to mention that, but uh, <laughs> we do because it, it's actually baffling how many people seem to be uh, not aware of anything. And let me also jump in here with um, if you have a question or if you're about to do anything stupid, just shoot us an email. I mean, seriously, we, yeah. we do not charge to answer your questions. We do not yeah. charge for emails. We don't even charge to review your cover letters. So before you send one out yeah. riddled with typos, just send it to us. Yeah. Seriously, yeah. before you do anything stupid, send yeah. us an email so we can tell you not to. <laughs> and it is a business of unwritten rules, and you can easily cross a line you're not aware of. So to have you as a touchstone it would yeah, be a blessing nice. to any new writer. Yes, that's great. So um, it, just to it, just to add on that business savvy thing, you know, um, it, you know, look, I, I, I get I get feeds every day from the rap, from the Hollywood Reporter, from Variety, from Deadline. 
every single day in my inbox this stuff comes in uh you know in the, in the old days you had your subscriptions and it came via paper but it, right. and that's that's all fine too but the, but the point is you know if you don't know what's going on in the business what people are buying what the trends are right. um then you you are flying blind and oftentimes we get people you know who will read the coverage that we send them back and which will make some marketability comment or or another and they'll get back to us and they'll say well, yeah, but the Godfather did it this way. Mm-hmm. Or, well, yeah, but in Dog Day Afternoon, this happened. It's like, well, yeah, those are brilliant movies, but they were made literally 45, 50 years right. ago. Right. It is right. it is not like that anymore. And, you know, right. that that's just a bunch of Pollyanna wishful thinking as to the way right. the business still right. works. The fact of the matter is, if you wrote The Godfather on spec, uh, it would probably land with a thud. You'd need to get that down to about a hundred pages. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. Yes. Absolutely. Um, and our last point is patience, because I, I think a lot of people kind of see this as a sprint as opposed to what it is, a marathon. In other words, I write a script, I send out a script, everyone will call me and I'm in the club. Wouldn't it be nice to think so? Now, it takes patience. There will be frustrations along the way. There will be obstacles. There will be lots of learning. Just embrace that. And by the way, good writing takes Tim. (laughs) 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 Would anyone else uh, like to add anything to this category? Oh, I think you said it beautifully, just beautifully. Yeah, we've covered this one, so let's, let's move on. 12 tips to get what it takes. So number one, coming back to money, get a job that leaves you with enough time, flexibility, and brain power so you can write. So in other words, think about what that can be, like what is your key marketable skill? What can you do, for instance, uh, you know, I see the photo of a security guard. Actually, great job for a writer, you know, not much going on, you sit around, you can write, you can do research. And example. that was that was my job in college. I was a, I was a security guard. Uh, I worked the four to twelve shift. I'd go into my office building. I'd lock up the office building on the weekend, and I'd sit down with my typewriter. Remember those things? And I would write. That's what I. That was my college job. So I was literally getting paid to write. It, it was a beautiful thing. Exactly. Number two, get a life. If you don't have a lot of interesting life experience, what are you going to write about? So true. And so, so, so many people make that mistake. They're so immersed in Hollywood and the business and and, and everything that they can't write an actual person because they are not an actual person. (laughs) You know, and with Get Alive, uh, one of the weird things that I have a belief in, find a way to be other. In other words, uh, we are in such a bubble in L.A. and in New York. Um, you know, I was talking about uh, my relatives in the Midwest. That is other. When I go there, I'm other. And I treat it like a foreign country, and I don't say that in a, in a dismissive way. You know, Tim right now is on the East Coast. He's in a very bucolic setting. But if he steps off that college campus, he is other. He is, he is um, the person observing a subculture. Find a way to be other. Exactly. And it also it will round out your life apart from making your writing better. Right. It will actually right. make your life better. You'll be a happier person. Believe right. me. Right. A, a uh, producer told me once he said that uh, he always dreaded, uh, you know, the, the time around June or so when uh, school would end because he knew that he would always get inundated with queries from the the latest graduating class of right. writing students who would all be writing their screenplay you know and they're 19 20 two years old whatever mm-hmm. so they had no life experience and their screenplays would always be about an emerging screenwriter who gets in trouble and you know right. winds, winds right. up on the run from the mob or or yeah. you know something like that and he was just like just just put a bullet in my head for crying out loud yeah, I, I guess I mean, it usually starts in the dorm, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, I, I've seen those too. I've seen those. Yeah. 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 All right. Pr- 
prioritize writing. So we talked about this before, you know, just make sure you schedule your day, you know, a, make sure you schedule day, your day so you have some time to write. Um, you know, make it a priority, you know, pay yourself first, as they say. This is something that I did when I had a small child. I would leave the house because I couldn't write at home. You know, my, my daughter, I love her to death, but, you know, she demands attention. And uh, but you know what she can't do is demand attention while you're at the library. So right. that's that's where I went to write, and uh, it worked out great. Yeah, exactly. Um, and some people have a hard time with discipline. I think it's all of us at some point or another. So you have to find ways to discipline yourself. And if you must, you know, ask your friends and family to hold your feet to the fire. Look, and th this is why taking a class is so is so important. And and frankly, this is probably I think the main reason why I enrolled in the UCLA professional program in screenwriting all those years right. ago, Tim. How uh, many years ago was that? I was just thinking about that. It was <laughs> years ago. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because I needed deadlines. I needed someone to to kick my ass and say you need to produce pages by a certain time. And having that class structure. Uh, or a writer's group, anything like that forces you to do that. Yeah, you yeah. have to be prolific. I mean, I'll just, again, not to keep hammering on the Newsham point, but she what is a her uh, lobbying firm, and she has two children under the age of six. And in the 20 weeks she was in my UCLA professional program class, she was required to write one script in 20 weeks. She wrote three. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, she's a machine and yeah. they're all good, which obviously is a big part of it, too. But she is prolific and you need to yeah. be prolific. And she she's good because she is writing. Pro, being prolific is part of being good yeah, great to, to, to work one script into the ground till it is completely beige and uninteresting versus writing four rapid scripts and then coming back for the rewrite, it's a very different experience. Yeah, very much so. All right, so all always have lots of scripts in, uh, or balls in the air. Um, mm -hmm. It allows you to work on something while you're waiting on feedback on another script. And hey, if everything goes south with one project, you know, you won't feel that bad because you'll know, eh, it's okay. I've got these other things that I've been working on. They're gonna be much better anyway. And they probably will be because, you know, we tend to improve with every new project. Yep. Absolutely. And we uh, uh, skipped over find a writing partner to shore up your weaknesses. And that can be a great, great thing because sometimes you have people who are very good in one area. For instance, they're great. They have great ideas. They're fantastic with structure, but they can't write character or dialogue to save their lives. Perfect. Find find a writing partner and, you know, who has uh, whose strengths are your weaknesses and vice versa. In particular, if you, in particular, if you are not a native English speaker, that is a great solution to the problem because, again, people do judge you. And if your grammar is not tight on page one, you could have the most amazing story in the world, um, but you're probably not going to get anywhere. But if you have a writing partner who you know can fill those holes, uh, great, so much the better. Yep. Right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, Improve every day. That's, I think, very important uh, because often people seem to like, OK, I, you know, I graduated and that's it. I, I, I'm done learning. I mean, you're never done learning. You're never perfect. Nobody is ever perfect. But, you know, you should still strive for it. Just try to improve every single day. Yep. Good. <clears throat> practice practice your pitch many times <laughs> in front of people and get feedback be like lula T tanya yeah, I, think, uh, I think we have to explain that reference yeah. so lula who, who used to be the brazilian president he started out as a union organizer and he was crippled with uh, he was so shy and, and crippled by fear of public speaking that what he did is he used to put photos of people all over his walls and just yeah. you know look at those photos and practice his speech and you know in quote unquote in front of people yeah and uh yeah if you if you want to read all about lula and how how he got railroaded there's a great article on the intercept.com uh poor guy um he's currently in prison um all right, <laughs> all right. Time uh, to practice this bitch. <laughs> yeah exactly exactly <laughs> take an acting class so uh it's actually very good if you want to learn how to write great dialogue actors 
who uh, then switch to screenwriting or add screenwriting to uh, their skill set are always, always, always excellent, interestingly enough, at writing dialogue. And the reason for that is probably because they spend a lot of time trying to make dialogue work in their work. Right. right. And also, of and course, right. it's great for pitching because you learn how to actually present yourself. And, yeah, so. and you learn how to get to the heart of it very quickly when you take an acting class because you're hanging out there with nothing. So you go right to the conflict, and that's what we writers need to do. So um, Emil Gladstone, who, um, you know, former ICM super agent, uh, he once told me when I interviewed him once that uh, he, he would send his clients, uh, his writing clients, to take acting classes uh, right. specifically because, you know, so much of what you do, w once the door opens and you're in the game, is you are meeting with people. And that is basically a performance. Right. You have to do a dog and pony show. You have to be compelling in the room. And, um, you know, there are lots of writers who are not that personality type. They're not really compelling speakers. Yeah. They get intimidated. They're taciturn. Uh, you know, they get intimidated. I mean, look, it's an intimidating thing. Um, so this can be really helpful in actually giving you those chops so that, you know, you are not the, um, you know, the shrinking violet. Right. Absolutely. Okay, number 10, get smart feedback and do the notes. The best material always emerges during the rewrite process. Absolutely. And, and you know, I think what will help writers a lot is to uh, change their perception because a lot of writers seem to have the perception of, oh my God, I have to do rewrites. That's just so terrible. And I, I think one way to look at it is you've done the hard work, you've built the sandbox by writing your first draft. And now you get to play in that sandbox and those are your rewrites. Yeah, exactly right. Agreed. And I am, I'm gonna say again that rewriting is where you show your chops. Rewriting is where you create the script that you intended. So rewriting is critical and I think it's the fun part of, of the writing, you know. Absolutely, I agree. If you do have connections, do not call them until you are certain your script rocks. And a lot of people make that mistake. Oh, it's right. the biggest mistake. It is absolutely the biggest mistake. I've made it. I, and, you know, even though I know that I've made it, I still continued to make this exact same mistake. Because what happens is you finish a screenplay or you finish a pilot and you're so excited about it and you feel that you've done great work and, and maybe you have. Uh, and you just want to get it out there and you want people to see it. And it never dawns on you or maybe it does and you just don't listen to that inner voice telling you that, you know, hey, maybe you should just get an idiot check just to make sure that it's as perfect as you think it is. Because chances are it isn't. You know, chances are it, maybe it is good, but, you know, every, pretty much everything can always be better. Um, you've got one shot when you call in that favor. You know, the higher the level of the person, you know, the, the more pressure it is that whatever you send them be great. And if it hits like a bomb blast on their desk or their computer, when you send it over, they will be impressed. But if you send them a first draft, uh, you know, or something where, you know, it's, it's just not up to what it could and should be, you've destroyed that connection. They will never think well of you again. And five years on, when you've actually done the work and you do have something that's good, and you go, hey, let me call up Uncle Joe in the business. You know what, Uncle Joe's not gonna be all that interested in reading your work anymore. So make sure that do not use those connections until you are positive you have independent third-party verification that your material is ready to rock. Right, right. And then we've said that before, it's a marathon, not a sprint. So in other words, uh, if you're in this for the long haul, don't get frustrated. I mean, you know, some frustration is part of the game, but again, it's a process. It's a process. It's a process. Look, right. I get frustrated all the time and I've been doing this for <laughs> years. And, um, you know, it's just, uh, it's just part of it. You know, I mean, look, I, I, you know, I, Tanya and I own a coverage company. We send our own material out 
for analysis all the time and the coverage comes back and you know what i am the i am just like the worst of our clients because i'm like this idiot reader he doesn't know what the hell he's talking how could he have missed what i was trying to get the, the, the dialogue here is great you know and then after a couple of days of sitting with it i'm like yeah, you take a breath uh, yeah maybe maybe there's some valid okay well i guess this might be right uh all right. Well, sure, it's much better now that I've rewritten it. But, you know, the, the person was still an idiot. You know, look, I mean, this, this is just it's our ego. It's it's our ego just jumping in to to, quote, protect us. It's not really protecting us. It's just it's it's a human survival mechanism. But I, frankly, I wish I didn't have it at all. <laughs> and we have one more one more one more thing here before we open it up to Q&A. Yeah. And it's a final thought. Um, so do you have what it takes? The answer is all of us have what it takes. And I just mentioned Emil Gladstone, the former super agent. He, he is now a producer. Uh, he told me this and this I, I will never forget this quote. It, it, it has stuck with me since he told me this like 10 years ago. Screenwriting is a craft like carpentry. It can be learned. And uh <laughs> You know, that that's what all of us are here to do is to help all of you guys learn. So yeah, and um, what you have to do is put in the sweat equity. Yep. Definitely. And, you know, uh, to extend the carpentry metaphor, you know, some of us are making beautiful shaker furniture. Some of us are making Chippendale. Some of us are, you know, making rough hewn tables from barn wood. So the, the tools you use will create what you need, but you have to know what those tools are and the skill set and how to use them effectively. Yep. Absolutely. And here, and here we are at the Q&A. So first question, does sharing uh, winning best screenplay or best pilot in a reputable competition help one get in the door? It will help you get read, yes. It will definitely help yes. you get read. And this also comes from not being precious. Get your stuff registered. If you feel better, go ahead and copyright it but register it and then just don't be precious to, you have to let people read it. You have to get it out there. Yeah. And if it's something that's already been, uh, received some accolades, yeah, let people read it, absolutely. Yep. Yeah, it, it, uh, I will caution you as someone who has run quite a few contests, um, you know, you have to choose the best from what has come in. And so, you know, you might have a script that won first place and it may still just be okay. It really just depends on what the, what the competition is. So yeah, you will get read, you will definitely get some reads, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's gonna do for you what you hope that it's going to do. Uh, now, obviously with, with the bigger contests that get five to 7,000 entries, you know, like the Academy Nickel and, and stuff like that, uh, if you win that, that is a pretty great feather in your cap. It generally means you've got it going on, but not always. I've read some nickel winners that I'm like, seriously? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's true. Um, and um, the other thing is this, is it also calls the meeting to order for you. In other words, if you've won a contest and you still are not getting action, that says you still have work to do. And you've got to be very honest about that. Absolutely. All right, on to the next question. Oh, by the way, guys, you don't have to uh, use the raise your hand function. You can just type your questions into the question chat box and we will make sure to get to them. Um, all right, next question. How important are contests and the blacklist? Ink tip seems not super useful. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, um, yeah, oh, go, go ahead, ahead Tim. Oh, uh, go I ahead. Gonna, I was just going to say, um, uh, with again, I'll go back to Nushin and her situation. She put, she wrote that script, you know, under my tutelage in a class, um, and before I could even show it to my producing partner, she put it on the blacklist, and she immediately got a request from Will Packer's company to look at it, and um, she took a meeting with them, and it didn't go as planned. It didn't play out, but 
you know, she got an immediate hit based on it and a meeting out of it. So again, I think it goes back to what Linda said, and I'm sure um, everyone at Coverage Inc. pushes too, which is that idea that the more people to read your stuff, the better. You know, you want as many people to read your stuff as possible. Right. So, so we we uh, did a webinar uh, last year. You guys should check it out on the Coverage Inc. website. It's completely free. Just go to coverageinc.com and click on the webinars tab. Scroll down to the bottom and you can watch the webinar on screenplay contests. Which ones are worth your time? Which ones are not? Uh, we we go into a lot of detail on that. I will say this about InkTip. Uh, InkTip is a great resource for a certain type of project. Uh, InkTip is where the below the radar uh, producers tend to look for material. You know, the ones who are not serviced by the industry. Uh, so in other words, the low budget producers. They're generally looking for genre type stuff, uh, you know, horror movies that can be made for $500,000, things like that. And if you have something that, that caters to those specific types of people, by all means, put it up on InkTip. I mean, that that's where those people go to find that type of material and they have had quite a lot of success with those types of movies getting made if you look you will not recognize a single name of any of the movies that have been made from screenplays <laughs> that have been set up from ink tip there's nothing wrong with that it just means right. that you know they're making it for probably you know 500,000 canadian and you know it's going out direct to streaming and foreign sales that's perfectly fine uh, by the way, Hollywood doesn't give a rat's ass about any of those things. They're completely right. useless in terms of your career. Uh, and I know from, believe me, I know from personal experience. Um, but, hey, it's a paycheck. Uh, it's it's a writing credit and it's uh, it's experience. Yep. Right. And it's often the way it's all the it's often the first cross of the threshold. Yep. So if you have the opportunity, take it. Absolutely. With all, with all the caution of due diligence, of course. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. absolutely. Okay, on to the next question. When you speak about your genre, how important is it, in your opinions, for aspiring writers to focus on one or two genres they do really well? How many is too many? Well, I would say it's crucial. Um, look, the industry loves to pigeonhole you, and um, you need to sell yourself as being – you need to have a brand. You know, your brand, when when you are going out there and representing yourself as a writer, putting yourself out there, you are a commodity and your brand should be this is this is what I do. I'm the new Jim Cameron. You know, I'm the new whatever it is. And, um, you know, th this could be a mashup, of course, of, of multiple different types of genres. But, um, you know, if you are writing period dramas and if you're writing sci fi comedies and if you're writing dark, weird Terry Gilliam things uh, and those are your three samples, no one is going to know what to do with you. So, you know, I as I, I like to say, writer pigeonhole thyself um, once you have broken in and you have relationships in the industry and and you are a known commodity they will allow you to stretch and that's where your manager comes in and you can go to your manager and say you know i had this idea i really wanted to do this sort of biopic about uh, nikola tesla or something i know it's totally unlike anything i've ever done before and your manager will say hmm, you know what why don't you give it a shot? I know someone who might be interested in something like that, or maybe he won't or she won't say that. But the point is you, you kind of have to earn the right to diversify. Yeah. Yeah. And I agree with that. And th this is the thing. Hollywood wants uh, an old thing in a new way. So learn your genre, but learn how to expand within the genre that it feels fresh. And the other thing is you will get opportunity because of something you do within the genre. And quite frankly, it's usually character work. So if you do a period piece, we fall in love with it because of the delivery of character within this grand epic. Uh, if you do sci-fi, we fall in love with it because we're in the point of view of a certain character. So within the genre, also focus very specifically to make it dazzle and to make it special and again to deliver uh, something old in a new way. Yep. I couldn't agree more. How would you suggest trying to get a writing partner that is at a similar level or hopefully higher level? 
<laughs> well, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think a, a writing partner is, um, I think you keep your antenna up, but you don't advertise that you're looking for a writing partner because it's going to be like being, a, I shouldn't use the reference because I'm, I, I've never used a dating site. I'm married 50 years, but um, you know, you don't want to keep swiping. I don't know if it's left or right. You've, you've got to you keep your antenna up more than advertise for it is what I would say. Absolutely. And I think often you also will meet your writing partner in a more organic fashion, for example, in, uh, in you know, a writer's group or in a class. Yeah, and I that's agree. What I, that's what I hear. When, I, when people find each other, it tends to be in that context, that they've already seen each other's work, they've already critiqued each other, they already have sort of um, similar ground in the way they look, and they have a similar language. Yeah, I just got an email um, yesterday from somebody I met at the Austin Film Festival two years ago at a party that I hosted, and I had connected her to someone else that I knew that I thought that they would kind of hit it off. They, I introduced them to each other at our party, and she emailed me today to say that you know they had just finished their second script writing together. So, you know, and obviously that's some weird synchronicity, you know, right place, right time. But again, that came through both of those people cultivating a relationship with me, and then I was in a situation to put them both together. Yeah, yeah. Right. So. So there's no like go to place that I would send anybody to to go yeah. look for or find a writing partner. There's no like Craigslist esque mes message board um, to find a writing partner. Although I, although I guess you could try posting on Craigslist. I, it, it probably yeah. couldn't hurt. Um, but yeah, I mean, take a class. You know, you you will meet like like minded people. You know, go to pitch fests and you know, just go to the networking event at the pitch fest or, or film festivals, you know, and you will meet people that that's how you meet other people who are at the same level that you are. And then from there, it's just, do you get along? Do you share, you know, commonalities? Do you like the same, same types of material? And uh, is this a relationship that might be beneficial? Absolutely. And On to the next the thing I would ask is, why are you looking for a partner? You know, why are why are you specifically having the goal of finding a writing partner? And is it um, uh, is it is it fear based in a way that I don't know much about structure? Well, you can learn about structure. You don't need a partner for that. So I would just I would just hang loose and be organic. If it happens, it happens. And if it doesn't, just work on your own writing skills. Well, Linda, that, that's 50% less work if you have a partner, isn't it? <laughs> it's also 50% Depends less work. on the partner. <laughs> I, I find, more work. Yeah, you, can, you can end up doing more work and actually tutoring when, when it should. So you just need, just keep your antenna up. That's all I'll say. And I, I would just work at being a little more independent and just keep your antenna up. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Next question. Isn't it better to write several low budget scripts and send them out via lead services than entering contests? I don't know what a lead service is. What's a lead service? Well, I, I think he uh, means something like a virtual pitch fest. Oh, OK. I don't know why you can't do. I, you know, why? Why does one uh, negate the other? Uh, well, yeah. It doesn't have to be either or. I, I think contests are still really looked at in the industry as being a preeminent source for finding new writers because they do the first level of screening and filtering. They've already created a hierarchy. Whether or not they're accurate, you know, but for the most part they are. So I, I, I but I don't think it's an either or proposition. I think the key word here is low budget. Um, I think what this person and and whoever asked that question, feel free to jump in and clarify. But I, I think the keyword here is low budget because um, maybe this is type of material that might not necessarily be looked upon favorably at oh, contests. You know, I, like it could be genre or sla you know, slasher movie, something like that. So, oh. it, you know, in that in that sort of case, sure, I would say by all means, you know, enter the blood list uh, if it's that type of material, or yeah. you know, be be specific, be smart about the contest that you enter. I, I certainly wouldn't 
you know, preclude, uh, you know, entering it from anybody. But yeah, you're probably not going to get anywhere at the nickel, for example. Well, let me right. let me make what seems like a, a crazy recommendation, but also an obvious recommendation. Uh, why not make the movie yourself? <laughs> if it's a low budget film, make it yourself. See what happens. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what we did with our last movie, yeah, exactly. and you know, we we bootstrapped the whole thing, and uh, it's premiering uh, in Shh, we're August. Not, we're, not, we're not supposed to talk about yeah, we, that. We, 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 yeah, we can't. <laughs> I've already circled the whole month of August now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I, I am glad though for that you clarified the question because you're absolutely right. There are certain genres that just don't show well in a contest. And they may be exceptional scripts and exceptional in the genre and have have that great audience waiting to see it. So uh, that really is uh, an important distinction. So thank you for clarifying that. All right, next question. What is your opinion of the American Screenwriting Association? Um, ASA, ASA is great. Uh, we're a member of the ASA. Uh, we love the ASA. So, um, yeah, I mean, look, it, it, it's relatively, I think it's pretty, pretty cheap. I don't remember what the exact fee is per year. It's, it's something pretty low. Um, but look, and any professional group of screenwriters that you can get some value out of and some benefit out of, um, go for it. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, I agree with that. Absolutely. Great. Jim, can you direct people again uh, towards uh, where to find our list of best contests? Um, sure. It's not a list. It is a webinar, uh, and it is on uh, coverageinc.com. And just click on the webinar tab and scroll down to the bottom, and you will see uh, the video right there. And just click on it, uh, and it's... Um, uh, I forget exactly what it was called, but it was all about the ins and outs of, uh, you know, contests and uh, you'll have to sit through another hour plus webinar, but it's worth it. It was it was a pretty great and uh, thorough uh, dissection of contests. And plus, we had a couple of guests who uh, read and judge for uh, several top contests in there who provided their insights. Excellent. And, and that's a real gift to the writers uh, to have someone. Uh, you know, sort of put it on a hierarchy basis and what to look for and what the benefits and that that is really uh, worth someone's time to go to that webinar. Absolutely. Next question. Is the reality right now that as writers, we should be focusing on TV to break into the industry or sell a spec script? Okay, so you guys feel free to uh, correct me if you have another perspective. Um, but um, it, obviously we're, we're in a new TV renaissance right now, but it, uh, and there's tons of TV being done. But in terms of actually being a piece of material that you can sell, uh, a pilot still doesn't quite have the same cred that a feature spec does. Um, there are a couple of different reasons for that that I've been told from agents and managers. Um, number one is that, you know, if you can write long form, 90 pages or 100 pages, you're telling a complete story. And, uh, you know, if you're good, they want to make sure that you, you can actually tell a complete story. And writing a feature does demonstrate your ability to do that, you know, to draw fully formed characters and tell a story from A to Z. Whereas with a pilot, it doesn't necessarily do that. More often than not, it doesn't. It just gets the balls into the air and then it ends. Uh, so it can still be a great piece of writing. It can still open doors for you. It, it can still do a lot. But I've been told from agents and managers that in terms of a writing sample, they still prefer features over pilots. That said, you should have both. I've also been told that um, you should have at least two features and one pilot before you go knock on in any agent or manager's door, uh, because that's what they're looking for. Um, any other uh, perspective you guys want to throw in there? Well, this is, uh, what, what I'm going to say is this, um, that I'm in agreement with you. And what I do find is when you have the feature script, Right now, because of subscription TV and the way they're laying out the series, it is the arc, the structural arc of what you do in a feature film. So if you look at, you know, Breaking Bad, you look at Fargo, um, you look at Deadwood and, and you know, uh, Game of Thrones, all those, you look at them, they have the arc of a feature within each season. 
So the, they want to know that you can structure according to that arc, which is the structure of a feature. The other thing is they are more than happy to turn a feature into a pilot for all the reasons you just said, that they now trust you as a writer and we can take this feature that we love and then create the pilot out of that. Uh-huh. So that's what I'm seeing. Yeah, and um, uh, the opportunities are going to be endless. Well, they already are, but there's some things happening in the streaming world, not only for pilots slash television shows or streaming shows, but also in terms of quote unquote feature films. Um, you know, not only at Netflix, but you know, we have to understand that every other major studio is about to launch their own streaming service. And so mm-hmm. some mm-hmm. of the stories in print um, about Disney Plus are, you know, that they are going to be um, producing more, you know, dozens and dozens of original shows and films just for the streaming service. Right, right. So, so I thought we're going to have the next wave of it, basically, and they're going to look at features that are then part of that streaming. Absolutely. So well, I, I look at yeah, and even look at Netflix right now. I mean, it's they're really blowing up in terms of their you know film slate. Uh, right, you know, look at right. Always Be My Maybe, uh, Someone Great. Um, right. You know, the new Adam Sandler, Jennifer Aniston right. movie. I mean, that would have been a touchstone movie 20 years ago. Yeah. Right. Now it's now yeah. it's a Netflix movie, and yeah. it's wildly successful. And they and Disney and Warner's and Universal and everybody else are gonna be right. you know blowing up with that kind of stuff over the next five yeah. years. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Next question. Would you prefer to read a wonderful script that is the same as what you have read before or something truly originally original that's maybe not well executed? No. Number number two for me. I can uh, always help you execute it better. Yeah. Uh uh, I don't, I don't, uh, they both sound like, <laughs> they, they both sound like heavy lifting. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm going to abstain. <laughs> I, 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 I'm going to wait, I'm going to go with Tim on this one, but, but it, it's kind of a, a, a soft check in that box, just because <laughs> I, I, I think, you know, having bold, fresh, original ideas is key but execution is also key. And the first the first one will show will demonstrate that you can successfully write uh you know in a genre or something like that. Um you know and it, it used to be that you could sell those things. You know back in the 80s and the 90s, you know we had what was known as good enough. Uh and you know if you gave your agent or your manager something that was good enough and it didn't matter if it was something we've seen before or not especially original. That was okay. You know, chances are they could sell that. It would be what they call a programmer. You know, it just uh, some stuff that they make just to feed the mill. And they still do make programmers, not as many. But, yeah. but, um, but, the, but the point is, it demonstrates that you can do it. That you know, and then you know, ideas. Maybe the producer on your next project will have an idea. So your agent or your manager might come along and pair you with a producer and say, "Okay, here, go write this idea with so and so." And then you'll develop uh, the project with that person, and then you'll have their idea, and then you'll have right. your great execution. So th- that can often work in your favor as well. But nowadays, if you're just kind of you know reiterating the same movie and doing it well, but there's nothing especially originated original about it you may not get in the door just because no one is really giving anybody a chance anymore unless there's something explosive about the material that really is different yeah let me admit of doing um a known genre in a new way you know there has to be something that is that draws you in that it is it doesn't feel like everything you've seen before yeah, let me amend my answer. Uh, the well-executed script that I've seen before is something I'll go out and sell, which I did with Nushin's, uh the startup. The wildly original but, but maybe rough around the edges script is something that I would be excited to see in terms of trying to help a new writer move forward. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I could not agree more. 
Um, so, guys, thank you for all of your questions. Ooh, and remember, no. you can always, always email us if you think of any more questions. And again, you're always welcome to email us. In fact, before you do something stupid, email us. Okay? <laughs> so we can talk about it. Wonderful. <laughs> so and I, I will. And I will also say, you know, you can find us on ProPath if you need clarification. Uh, if we've made a statement that has baffled you or, or just doesn't sit well with you, don't be afraid to find us on ProPath and, and just ask for clarification. Oh, and remind everybody, uh, the, the rewrite seminar, when is that? What's, uh, what's the deal with that? Saturday, August 10th from 8.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. at the Metaphor Club in Los Angeles. Um, it is a one-day seminar. You can, and we will be talking about rewriting and the steps to take to rewrite in the first half of the seminar. And then the second half of the seminar, we're actually going to rewrite um, selected participants' pages live. So you can see part of the process. You can discuss, discuss the choices made. You can sign up at www.propathscreenwriting.com. Right on.